the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Listeners, welcome back today. We have the pleasure of having one of our student scholarship winners from 2023 on the podcast, Lucy Bowers. Lucy is attending the PA program at the University of Kentucky, and Lucy, thank you for being on our podcast. Yeah, of course. Lucy's case study is called Fibular Nerve Neuroplasty and Osteoplasty for Leg Length Discrepancy. That case study earned her a spot as one of our four finalists and scholarship winners and was based on the case of a mangled lower extremity trauma from a motorcycle crash. Lucy, please tell our listeners about catastrophic lower extremity injuries and where we are these days in the treatment of these types of traumas. Please talk about limb prostheses and salvage surgery, limb amputation. What is the LEAP study? Limb salvage can do very well depending on the patient and the factors surrounding their injuries. We also know that prostheses have also come really far now and are great options for patients. And so really, it depends on the patient's injury factors and and factors that are surrounding that. So in my case report, I did mention a study that was done, the Lower Extremity Assessment Project, the LEAP study. And this was a good study that looked at where we kind of are at for limb salvage. Um, So it included injuries where amputation was a consideration for severe injuries. Um, It was a prospective observational study, had about 600 patients that were enrolled that had high energy, lower extremity injuries across several level one trauma centers. Ultimately, it found that social factors were more predictive of the patient's outcome than treatment strategy, meaning the social factors that the patient had at home um, in their life can be a better predictor of whether the patient can do well with a limb salvage versus an amputation at that time. Why do social factors play such an important role in the outcome of a patient who has suffered this type of injury where the treatment may be a prosthesis versus amputation? How does that affect the decision for this type of treatment? I think there's quite a few social factors that play a role. Um, One, you have to think about manual labor jobs. So if they're on a high labor job that is going to require them to be on their feet more, you're going to want them to have a good option that they can potentially get back to their job. Accessibility to care here in Kentucky, where I go to school, you have to think about a lot of rural populations that we have here in the eastern and western part of the state. And so them getting back to our um, hospital or receiving care at our hospital, doing their follow-up care, where are they going to get their prosthesis from or, or doing their care for their limb salvage. And then another factor could be cost, patient having insurance, not having insurance. How does the cost factors of of that prosthesis and amputation or limb salvage play a role for that patient as they progress throughout their recovery? Okay, on to your case study. Unfortunately for the patient you presented, he suffered a severe trauma to the lower extremity involving multiple fractures, a proximal tibiofibular dislocation, an open fracture with severe soft tissue injury, Lucy, uh, this is just, as I mentioned earlier, a mangled extremity. Please describe the initial findings and how it was managed. You also talked about several surgeries that the patient had to undergo, and please describe for our listeners some of these procedures and outcomes. So our patient was a 22-year-old male who presented with left lower extremity pain. He was in a helmeted motorcycle crash when he was hit by an ambulance. He arrived in our emergency department innovated and sedated with a mangled left leg extremity with an open proximal tibia fracture and a significant amount of soft tissue damage that had approximately 150 centimeters of intact skin anterior laterally. He had no palpable or doppable detected dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulses. And his x-ray read as an acute open traumatic Comminuted segmental left proximal tibial shaft fracture and a proximal tibiofibular joint dislocation. So the patient went to the OR the next day, received an IND, a fasciotomy, and a placement of a uniplanar X-fix. He was ultimately referred to our attending physician for limb salvage versus amputation. So over the next month, he had about 11 surgeries, including many INDs, placement of antibiotic needs beads, a rotational uh, gastroc, flap, 
split thickness of skin graft and eventually had a placement of a tibial nail done for stability of the fracture. But during this time, he underwent about 17 centimeters of gradual shortening to allow for the soft tissue coverage. And his proximal fibula injury was not able to be addressed at this time due to prior to being the soft tissue injuries. And so that's one thing that when patients come in with significant soft tissue injuries and a fracture, prioritizing those soft tissue injuries first before the fracture is one thing that they can do to kind of help salvage the limb. And so that is ultimately why that proximal fibula injury was not addressed at that time. Okay. After a lot of surgeries and a lot of time, uh, I think you said about a year and a half after the fact, he started to develop some neurogenic problems and a foot drop. There was also a leg length discrepancy. And can you please talk about your evaluation and workup from that point? He underwent multiple imaging, which continued to show no acute fractures and healing, but was coming in with these symptoms of neurogenic symptoms. And so at that time, we placed him in an excess embrace to help with that foot drop, which he adhered to for many months, but then came back and said, I'm still having increased pain over this proximal fibula and was starting to have skin breakdown in this area. So that was when the option came of what's next for the patient. I think you said he had a shoe lift and was also braced for a time with the foot drop. And when he came back for a recheck after the bracing and stuff, he, he was like, I don't know, I'm thinking about a BKA at this point. What were the next steps in his management? Yeah, so the patient was considering a below the knee amputation due to his quality of life issues. He felt like he wasn't able to to live the life at full quality that he wanted to. At the time, he was a new dad, and he was not able to do the activities that he once loved to do because of the pain. When he came into the clinic, our attending physician spoke with him about, well, BKA is an option, but I also think we can look at undergoing a neuroplasty of that fibula nerve, removing that hardware, and then doing an osteoplasty with a placement of the precise nail. And so the patient, Obviously, a BKA would be a little bit more extreme if we had this more other option that could allow the patient to keep his limb um, and get him back to the activities that he wanted. So patient went home and thought about it for a little bit, came back and elected to have the salvage options. And so at that time, he underwent the neuroplasty first, which the perineal nerve was placed in a more favorable position, um, and then some scar tissue was removed. He then returned about four months later and got his hardware removed and then had an osteoplasty, which is where bone grafting and bone repair is done. And then a precise nail was placed to help address the limb length discrepancy. Lucy, please tell our listeners what is a precise, that's P-R-E-C-I-C-E, tibia IM nail and how it was used in this case. Yeah, so a precise nail has been found to be a great option to help patients achieve limb length treatment for those who have a limb length discrepancy. And so what it does is it uses earth magnets that are connected to a gearbox and screw shaft to allow for customized lengthening. And the patient will go home with a handheld external remote control adjustment device, an ERC. And that starts to be used around two weeks post-op. Patient is given instructions at that time. And they undergo using this ERC to help with the lengthening. Research has found that it has very low complication rates, but a very high patient satisfaction rate. It is fairly new, but has been, again, been found to, to really help patients and have that high satisfaction for patients who are suffering from a length deformity. And what about the proximal tibiofibular joint dislocations? How are these usually managed? Proximal tibiofibular joint dislocations are a rare finding in emergency cases. They're reported in high impact collisions. Um, and a lot of the time, patients with this diagnosis tend to have lateral leg pain and can go on to develop a foot drop. And then perineal nerve entrapment syndrome can be a common neuropathy from this kind of joint dislocation. So in this case, our patient had that proximal tib-fib joint dislocation that fixing it was unable to be addressed and then ultimately went on to have this nerve entrapment syndrome, which again is common with the type of joint dislocation that he had, had the very common symptoms for it, which were able to be addressed later on. 
So Lucy, tell us about Indianapolis. Did you have a good time? And tell us about some of the people you met. I did, yes. I met so many good people and learned a lot. I want to thank you so much for taking time to come on the podcast. And again, congratulations on winning one of the 2023 PAOSF Student Scholarships. Lucy Bowers. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. We also welcome you to visit our website, paos.org, where members can download virtual conference content and get Category 1 CME. Also, if you're a non-member and you're interested in our CME content, please visit the aapa.org Learning Central for the PAOS virtual content.